Bill and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio and WBCA. Watching and listening on... Somerville Community Access TV or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you as always. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I've got five movies to review for you for this show, and I also have a disclaimer that says that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are listening or who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, let's get into my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And what's really surprising is that the number one and number two movies at the box office are exactly the same as they were last week and the week before that. Three weeks in a row, these two movies have held the number one and number two spot at the box office. Occupied by the, the number one spot, which is Crazy Rich Asians, which is getting, apparently, crazy rich word of mouth. And it earned $28.3 million this past weekend, which is not stellar, but for Labor Day weekend, it is pretty good. And that is against a budget of $30 million. So it made practically almost its budget this past weekend in the United States alone. But total, it has so far grossed $117 million here in the United States and $137 million around the world, making it a very deserved certified hit here in the States and around the world. The Meg is number two at the box office this weekend, as it was last week and the week before that, having grossed $13.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. And my guess is, given that it's a summer movie, kind of like Jaws, we will probably see it sink as the weeks go on, but probably not take a huge drop. But in any event, The Meg, which has a budget ranging from 130 to $178 million, has so far grossed in the United States $123.4 million, and around the world it has grossed $465.7 million. So I can't call it a hit of any kind here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. Mission... Mission Impossible Fallout is actually the only film on this list that has actually climbed instead of uh, instead of fallen or remained the same. Last week it was number four at the box office. This week is number three at the box office, having grossed $9.1 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $178 million, Mission Impossible Fallout has so far grossed $206.4 million here in the States and $649.1 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit all around the world. Now, the number one highest grossing debut movie at the box office is Operation Finale, which debuted at number four at the box office this past weekend, having grossed just $7.8 million here in the States, and that's just this weekend. Total has grossed $9.5 million because it opened on Wednesday, August 31st, i.e. last week, and that's against a budget ranging from 20 to 24 million dollars. So it's not a hit yet, but it's made nearly half of its budget in just one weekend, so it's off to a very good start. And I don't have any numbers on how it did internationally. Searching is also a movie that debuted this week at number five, making it the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, and it grossed $7.7 million uh, just this past weekend in the States. And it has grossed $14.6 million worldwide so far. I don't have the budget for that movie, but I should have it by next week. It's just no sources have given out the budget of that movie so far, but it's off to a pretty good start. Number five, excuse me, number six of the box office is Christopher Robin, the Disney movie, which grossed $6.7 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend and was number six of the box office last week, if you can believe it. Uh, <clears throat> 
Against a budget of $75 million, Christopher Robin has so far made $87.1 million here in the States and $133 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. And it will probably stay a tentative hit, at least in the States, but it may eke its way to being a certified hit worldwide by either next week or the week after that. Alpha is also a movie that stayed pretty much where it is. Last week was number seven. This week it's also number seven, having grossed $6 million even at the box office. Against a budget of just $51 million, Alpha has so far grossed $28.9 million here in the States and $47.2 million worldwide, which means basically that it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. And even though it's holding steady at number seven, just like it did last week, it doesn't look like it's going to recoup its budget, so it looks like it's going to be a flop. But then again, I could be wrong. Speaking of flops, The Happy Time Murders was number three at the box office when it debuted last week. This week, it dropped all the way to number eight. It's not the biggest drop of the week, but it is pretty significant, especially for a film that's only two weeks old. This weekend, it grossed $5.5 million at the U.S. box office, and the word must not have been strong for this one because on a budget ranging from from 40 to 47 million dollars the happy times murders has so far excuse me the happy time murders has only grossed 18.1 million dollars here in the states and 21.2 million dollars worldwide and if we don't see this movie in the top 10 next week i actually will not be surprised Black Klansman, the Spike Lee joint, is number nine at the box office, sliding slightly from number eight last week. But despite the fact that its time in the top ten hasn't been short, uh, hasn't been long, and doesn't look like it'll be much longer, it is still doing really well for itself. It grossed $5.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend against a budget of $15 million. Black Klansman has so far grossed $39.5 million here in the States and $57 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And finally, Mile 22 took an equally big drop from the Happy Time Murders. It was number five last week. This week it dropped five spots to number 10, having grossed $4.6 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget range from 35 to 60 million dollars mile 22 has so far grossed 32.7 million dollars here in the states and 39 million dollars worldwide meaning that it's not a hit yet here in the states or around the world hi i'm danica patrick watching my nieces grow play and learn is amazing but not every child gets to be carefree one in six kids in the u.s are hungry this breaks my heart and it's something that feeding america is working to change each year the feeding america network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society. Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie we're going to be reviewing, I'm going to be reviewing for you, is Operation Finale. And this is the latest movie directed by Chris Weitz and starring Oscar Isaac and Ben Kingsley. And it is the true story about Israeli spies from the Mossad. And the Mossad, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is the... Institute for Intelligence and Special Operations in Israel. And these spies are basically out to find 
Nazi war criminals who have somehow evaded arrest or even suicide. In other words, they had successfully escaped from Germany, Austria, or whatever countries they were occupying and somehow sought refuge in another continent. Some succeeded and some failed, or at least they evaded arrest by suicide like Hitler and Heinrich Himmler and several other high-ranking Nazi officials did. But there was one particular high-ranking Nazi official that managed to seek refuge in Argentina where he managed to lay low for 15 years. I would say that's quite an accomplishment, but then again, we are talking about the Nazis here. And that officer was Adolf Eichmann, who in this movie is played by Ben Kingsley. And what's really strange about the casting choice in this movie is that Ben Kingsley actually played a Jew in Schindler's List. And I believe he was nominated for an Oscar for Schindler's List. He didn't win, but I believe he was nominated. And the character he plays in this movie, Operation Finale, Adolf Eichmann, was known as the... Well, he was a lieutenant colonel for the, the Nazis, and he was known as being basically the architect of the Holocaust. He was the one who created the logistics involved in the mass deportation of Jews and other minorities to ghettos and extermination camps in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe during World War II. So the Mossad in this movie, and this film takes place in 1960, by the way, is working to track down Adolf Eichmann, and especially in an age without cell phones or computers or even that many cameras or basically they they have to rely on phone conversations and telegrams they had a very hard time tracking adolf eichmann down but once they did and once they apprehended him in argentina it turns out getting him from argentina to israel uh, into jerusalem to stand trial was much easier said than done especially when adolf eichmann had a number of allies in argentina who might not have been involved in the holocaust and probably Probably weren't even in Nazi occupied Eastern or Western Europe during or even before World War II, but they are Nazi sympathizers who would stop at nothing to protect Herr Eichmann. So the movie does pretty well with showing the Mossad actually tracking down Adolf Eichmann without the aid of any real discernible discernible proof, particularly because they didn't have smartphones or computers. They they did have photographs, but again, that the photographs back then had to be sent by mail, and mail travels pretty so, slowly, especially when you consider that it's mail traveling from South America to Eastern Europe. Not a very easy thing to do. And the whole movie could have been based on the Mossad capturing Adolf Eichmann, but as it turns out, that's only the beginning, which serves as both a strength and weakness to the narrative structure of Operation Finale, because a big part of Operation Finale, the movie, is actually showing Adolf Eichmann in a room where he's being held on semi-house arrest with these Israeli spies, many of whom have had close relatives die because of the Nazis, including the main Israeli spy, Peter Malkin, who in this movie is played by Oscar Isaac. And I liked Ben Kingsley in this movie. I liked Oscar Isaac. And I and I especially enjoyed several of the supporting performances, including Melanie Laurent, who not only plays one of the Israeli spies, or one who has been semi-retired and now works as a doctor, but she also had a previous relationship with Oscar Isaac's character, Peter Malkin, which makes the two of them working together somewhat awkward, but also serves as a strength as the movie progresses, as you might think it does. So the conflict of the movie comes with Ben Kingsley's character now being captured and also playing psychological games with several of the spies, including probably the good cop of the spy, who is Oscar Isaac's character, Peter Malkin. But unfortunately, when the big parts of the movie 
are when Adolf Eichmann is captured and then the Israeli spies have to get Eichmann from Argentina onto a plane to Jerusalem without being tracked down or sabotaged by the Nazi sympathizers in Argentina. That unfortunately leaves a big narrative gap where it's just Ben Kingsley and Oscar Isaac and maybe some other Israeli spies in the movie just talking to each other in a dark room. And as a result, the pace of this film feels more sluggish than it should be, especially with a true story of this caliber and this magnitude. But another problem I had with the movie was the casting of the people who were Israeli spies. Granted, they're all really good actors, especially Oscar Isaac, but one of the problems I had was that there were several Americans, including Oscar Isaac and Nick Kroll, who were playing these Israeli spies, and they spoke with American accents. The only one who didn't speak with an American accent was Melanie Laurent, but she can have a pass because she's French. But you have Ben Kingsley's character as Adolf Eichmann, who's speaking in a very thick German accent. And this movie almost implies that the good guys in this, this movie are ones who are American and the bad guys are German, which is not a good message to send across to Western audiences. So as good as the acting is, Operation Finale is a little bit of a letdown narrative-wise and gets my rating of a checkout. It's still very superbly acted, and Ben Kingsley might actually get nominated for Best Supporting Actor for this role. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak. I'd walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. Hey everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. But if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Searching. And Searching is a movie that premiered at Sundance and got very good word of mouth, not to mention now that it's coming out in the summer, really good distribution as well. And this is one of those films I went into not knowing really anything about it. And that's actually what I like about going to movies. If I can go to a movie theater, walk into a movie, and know everything, absolutely nothing about it except for what's on the screen in front of me that to me is a good movie experience but not a lot of people can have that especially with Apple movie trailers and IMDB and YouTube constantly shoving trailers in your face if you can avoid movie trailers I highly recommend it but I do only because I see just about everything if there's a movie out in theaters chances are there's an 85% chance I've seen it but searching is really a very pleasant surprise because it's one of those films that I kind of knew was going to be somewhat of a found footage movie, but I had no idea how great this movie would be. So the easiest movie to which to compare Searching is probably Unfriended, only because Searching takes place entirely on a computer desktop. Anytime you see a character, it's usually via Skype or some kind of camera within the computer or maybe even disattached to the computer, kind of like I'm broadcasting on Facebook right now, or it's via, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook chat, and, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, even though I wasn't in love with the movie Unfriended, and I hated the sequel that came out, Unfriended Dark Web, I think I gave that my rating of a strikeout, which is my second lowest rating for a movie, I... I did actually hear other reviews of Unfriended, which were a little bit more favorable than mine. And one reviewer, uh, Doug Walker, actually from ChannelAwesome.com, actually said something really interesting when he reviewed Unfriended a couple of weeks ago. He said that the best actor in Unfriended was the mouse. And 
That is certainly true with this film, Searching, but unlike Unfriended, John Cho and Deborah Messing, who co-star in this film, are really great. Probably put the mouse in this movie to shame. But with that said, the mouse actually does act as a really good actor in this film. So, without me gushing about the the way this movie was made, let me just talk about what Searching is about. Unlike Unfriended, it's not a supernatural horror thriller. It's actually a kidnapping mystery that would probably be approved by Alfred Hitchcock. As a, as a matter of fact, if Alfred Hitchcock were alive today and he had no choice but to make a found footage movie, he would probably make one like Searching. So, anyway, this is a movie about a desperate father whose name is David Kim, and he's played by John Cho, best known for being Harold in Harold and, and Kumar go to White Castle and the, the two sequels that it had. And he's also known for creating the term MILF. Because he was the first one, I think, in movie history to ever use the term MILF. Mother, I'd like to, you know what. And he did that in the move in the first American Pie movie. Yep, that was him. So anyway, uh, John Cho has grown up now. And in this movie, he has a 16-year-old daughter who goes missing. And, he, and David breaks into... Her, his daughter's laptop to look for clues to find her. And he also enlists the help of a sympathetic and professional uh, detective in the local San Francisco uh, police department who is played by Deborah Messing and that detective's name, uh, Deborah Messing's character's name, I almost had it. I... Ah, shoot. This, this is why it pays to do research ahead of time. Uh, I almost got it. But in any event, Deborah Messing plays the detective who helps John Cho's character search for his missing daughter. The detective's name is Detective Vic. I don't think you're given a first name here, but you pretty much find out all you need to know about Detective Vic from actually some Google searches that John Cho's character does. And I also should mention that Probably even less so than Unfriended, Searching reminded me actually of a an ad for Google that aired during the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. And the ad for Google was just somebody, it was just a, a, a Google web page where somebody was typing in search results. But what was fascinating about that commercial was that it was so simple. It just showed somebody typing in or rather it just showed typing but if you paid attention to what the person was typing whom you never see you actually learn a lot about that person and even though searching actually shows you the characters via skype or or webcam that are you know frantically searching for the, the this missing child you're you're still given a really good story and very rich exposition just from somebody typing in search terms or looking through Instagram or Snapchat photos. It's it's really fascinating how this movie comes together, and it is gripping. That's something I did not say about Unfriended. Although I do have to say this. Unfriended was more of a satire about young people and how they are addicted to social media and can't get off their laptops and so on and so forth, which is a little dated since a lot of young people now can't get off their smartphones. But in any event, um, this movie doesn't so much satire the information superhighway as much as it as it shows how much people are dependent for good and for bad of sites like Google, like Facebook, like Twitter, and so on and so forth to find crucial information that 10 years ago they wouldn't have been able to find as easily. But that's the world we're living in right now. And rather than parodying that trend, searching shows that you can use those tools that we take for granted today, perhaps, with a good <laughs> internet connection, and tell a gripping story that doesn't necessarily have to be horror. So not only was the, the, the setup of this movie extremely clever and builds upon something that's been done before, but John showed and Deborah Messing are amazing in this film. I'd like to see them nominated for Oscars, but in any event, 
Surging gets my rating of a knockout. It certainly was an incredibly pleasant surprise to go in this film and absolutely be blown away by technology that just so simply broadcast on this screen. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, hey. social events, what? And the Black Experience. Okay. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, you are listening to uh, Words on Film on Boston Free Radio and WBCA 102.9 FM. You are watching Words on Film on Scat V or some community access TV station that's kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on... Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one called Kin. K-I-N. And this is a movie that is directed by brothers Jonathan and Josh Baker, who actually made this movie as an expansion of a short film they did called Bagman. And I like when compelling short films are expanded into compelling feature-length films. And there certainly are moments of kin that are compelling. Is the whole movie compelling? In my opinion, no. But there are some actually good performances and also some memorable parts to kin. It's just not a great film, but let me explain. So kin is about a young black child, probably about 14 years old, and he's played by a promising young actor named Miles Truitt, who is undoubtedly the best part of this movie. And he is being chased by a vengeful criminal, the feds, and a gang of otherworldly soldiers, along with his brother, or his adopted brother, a recently released ex-con, and the two of them are forced to go on a run with a weapon of mysterious origin as their only protection. So how does... This character played by Miles Truitt, who's play, whose name is Eli, find this weapon. Well, he lives in Detroit along with his adopted father, uh, Hal, who's played by Dennis Quaid. And he eventually finds this, this gun that looks like a weapon you'd find in a Halo video game or some, you know, ultra-violent... PlayStation games similar to that. So he doesn't quite know how it works. At first, like most 14-year-olds do, he kind of plays around with it, gets in front of the mirror, and sort of acts like a tough guy. But then, eventually, his brother, who is recently released from prison, whose name is Jimmy, who is actually Dennis Quaid's character's biological son, unlike Eli, and Jimmy is played by Jack Rayner, who's an actor I wasn't entirely familiar with when before I saw this film, but he does a really good job in, in this film as well, and I think that he and Miles Truitt work pretty well together, and their relationship serves as probably the main strength of Kin. But unfortunately, Jimmy even though he's released from prison, is still in trouble with a dangerous gangster and gang leader by the name of Taylor Ballack, who's played in this movie by James Franco. And James Franco is a little bit hammy in this film, probably hammier than he should be. And I, I think that actually casting James Franco in this movie, even though he's arguably the most well-known actor in this film, was... A, a bit of miscasting. I would have liked to have seen somebody who's bigger and probably more imposing in that role. Because otherwise, seeing James Franco with those 
with those grills, those fake teeth, and seeing him kind of act like a gangster was a little hammy and, and tacky for me. But eventually, an accident happens where a character dies, and Jimmy goes on the run with an unsuspecting Eli, and they're basically running for their lives. But eventually, this gangster, who's James Franco's character, Taylor, finds out where they're going, and tries to track them down. In the meantime, they go to a podunk nowhere town and go to a strip club where they meet a stripper with a heart of gold named Millie, who's played by Zoe Kravitz. And I actually thought that the three of... The three actors, Miles Truitt, Zoe Kravitz, and Jack Rayner, once they got together, that made the story a little bit more interesting. In addition to that, once Eli actually finds out the power of the gun he holds and what it can actually do, in other words, not only can it kill people, but it can also seemingly destroy matter as well, which is huge, (laughs) no real life ammunition can actually do that, he is almost hunted down by these bounty hunters who are called cleaners, who are actually secretly, uh, well, uh, at least one known, at least one well-known actor who I won't reveal makes a cameo at the very end once the cleaner actually takes off his mask. But very much like Lord of the Rings, any time that Eli uses this weapon, unbeknownst to him, these cleaners can detect where the weapon is being fired, and go right after Eli for the weapon that, obviously, like the ring in the Lord of the Rings series, holds a lot of power. So it is part road trip movie. Certainly it has some sci-fi elements to it, and it's undoubtedly an action film. The the pacing of the movie sometimes leads a little bit more to be desired. As I said before, James Franco's care or James Franco himself is miscast in this film. I think he has still a little bit of weirdness in his character that probably rubbed off from his previous role as Tommy Wiseau. And I think once James Franco begins to focus more on his character and a little bit less on maybe being weird or being hammy, he might actually turn in some great performances. And I know that James Franco is one of those actors who's not only very popular, but can also act really well. I've seen him act well in several, not only other movies, but also some TV shows like Freaks and Geeks. The guy can act. I think just right now he's in a little bit of a of a funk when it comes to his acting. And... Again, I I also thought he was miscast, even though he won a Golden Globe for his performance in The Disaster Artist, where he played Tommy Wiseau. I thought he was miscast because, A, it's very easy to play weird, and B, he was way good looking, too good looking to play Tommy Wiseau. But, again, Kin is a pretty good movie. It certainly has very good special effects. I loved Miles Truitt in this film as the lead. He had my sympathies immediately. I also liked Zoe Kravitz as, well, <laughs> a a stripper with a heart of gold in this film. She certainly reflected her heart of gold very well. And Jack Rayner also turned in a commendable performance. But, again, this film ended almost where it should have been the middle, I think. But it does get my rating of a checkout because I was very entertained by it. I was impressed with most of the acting as well. When I was little, I didn't talk for a long time. I was sensitive to lights and sounds, so I built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. Sometimes I do the same things over and over until one day I found out I had autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. BFR. BostonFreeRadio.com I love those real sick signs. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blow, neurotic toe. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpacker Music. 
Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Juliet Naked. And a lot of people hear that this movie has Rose Byrne in it, so I'll just get this <laughs> probably misconception out of the way. Rose Byrne does not play Juliet in this movie, nor is she naked in this film. So for those of you male listeners who were probably hoping for that, I don't blame you if you shut your radios or your computers off now. I I totally understand but it does tell a really interesting story and it's actually based on a book written by nick hornsby who wrote the books high fidelity and about a boy both of which were made into well-reviewed movies i haven't seen about a boy but i have seen high fidelity that's one of my favorite john cusack films and for that matter probably jack black's best performance on screen to date. That's certainly the movie that made him a household name. And Juliet Naked does share some similarities with High Fidelity. For instance, both films involve, to one degree or another, a an older music fan who has a big stack of records and is a pop culture fan probably at the expense of his relationship with his girlfriend. That's probably the biggest parallel you can draw between Juliet Naked and High Fidelity. But the movie is actually not about that guy. That guy, by the way, is a character by the name of Duncan, who's played by Chris O'Dowd. Unlike the main character in High Fidelity, Duncan is actually a college professor who specializes in media studies. And he lives with his girlfriend, Annie, who's the character played by Rose Byrne. And one of the things that drives a wedge in between their marriage is Duncan's obsession with, uh, not obsession to the point of stalking, but just obsession in terms of being a big fan, but his certain obsession, particularly amongst um, followers of his online, with a reclusive one album wonder by the name of Tucker Crow, who's played by Ethan Hawke. And Tucker Crow is one of those artists I would probably compare best to Rodriguez, who was the who is the subject of the 2012 documentary Searching for Sugar Man. In other words, he had one album in the early 90s and then mysteriously disappeared from the music scene pretty much without a trace. And of course... People on the internet have been scurrying to find out where Tucker Crow is now. And there are certain rumors and misconceptions about what Tucker Crow is doing and also where he might be. That There's one prominent rumor in this film that Tucker Crow is on a sheep farm in Pennsylvania. And Tucker Crow, by the way, is played by Ethan Hawke. And eventually, Chris O'Dowd's character gets a CD from Tucker Crow's former record company, which has Tucker Crow's one album, Juliet, stripped down without the electronic instruments in it, and the stripped down album is called Juliet Naked. And apparently that's the that's the music term for for music that's stripped down without its ostentatious producing. For instance, the Beatles' last album, Let It Be, which was released in 1970, actually had a naked version that was released in 2003, which took out Phil Spector's Wall of Sound and was, because it was a Beatles semi-lost album, a big hit. I know I certainly got a copy for myself when it came out. So no one really knows what happened to... Tucker Crow until Chris O'Dowd's character publishes a review of Juliet Naked on his website. It gets a lot of comments, but it also gets a negative comment from his girlfriend, Annie. Now that drives, of course, them further apart, uh, Annie and Duncan, but it also gets Annie a mysterious pen pal who turns out to be Tucker Crow himself. And without revealing too much, Tucker Crow's, of course, not dead. I, I don't think anyone who even skips the previews like I do would, would come to that conclusion. But the the relationship that goes on between 
Annie, played by Rose Byrne, and Tucker Crow, played by Ethan Hawke, is one of the big things that drives this movie. The poster gives off the impression that this is going to be a movie about a love triangle, and fortunately it didn't go that way. And I'm really glad that it didn't, because it made this movie, which could be considered a romantic comedy, they're uh, much less formulaic than most other romantic comedies. It's directed by Jesse Peretz, who is, as far as I know, an American director who has brought us such previous films as Our Idiot Brother and The Chateau, both of which starred Paul Rudd, by the way. And Paul Rudd actually would have been an interesting casting choice for Juliet Naked, but then again, Ethan Hawke, of course, is a really good actor and may actually be nominated, if not for this movie, for his role in First Reformed, which came out earlier this year and was directed by Paul Schrader. But Jesse Peretz, like he showed in Our Idiot Brother, has a knack for romantic comedies that guys will like and this is certainly no exception plus when Annie actually meets uh, Tucker face to face their chemistry is undeniable but I also liked a lot of the supporting actors but if I mentioned who the supporting actors were and how their characters were related to Tucker Crow I would be giving a lot away but I I recommend that people see this film, and I try to also resist the urge to say, if you liked this film, you'll also like this film. So, as tempted as I am to say, if you liked High Fidelity, you'll like Juliet Naked, I really have to hold back. But I mean that in every way. I guess I pretty much just said it. But Juliet Naked gets my rating of a knockout. I think people who want to see Rose Byrne naked are probably going to be disappointed by this film. But trust me when I say that, don't walk out of it because that's not in the film. In other words, you are going to get a highly original romantic comedy that's acted well by particularly the three leads, Rose Byrne, Ethan Hawke, and Chris O'Dowd, and also some great location shoots. Like, for instance, the film is is has been shot in England, and Rose Byrne and Chris O'Dowd's character live in this beautiful seaside uh, c- city. Man, Damn it. do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go fish that! Oh, come on! <laughs> this is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage, and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Wife, which came out in theaters this past month, but it was actually released in 2017 at last year's Toronto International Film Festival, and I guess it must have had some trouble getting distribution, but Sony Pictures Classics picked it up, and it's actually really good that it did. So the movie involves a 
husband and wife. The wife is named Joan Castleman, and she's played by Glenn Close. And the husband is Joe Castleman, who is a professor who's played by Jonathan Price. He's not only a professor, but also a best-selling author of fiction. And the movie takes place actually primarily in December of 1992. Why it was chosen for then, I don't know. I don't exactly know. But it was fiction, so I guess the writer of the wife, the the novelist Meg Wolitzer, chose whatever year she wanted to. But it is interesting that it takes place in 1992 because there are certain developments within the story that may not have taken place if we were living in 2018 and we had cell phones and and immediate access to the internet via Wi-Fi and, and 4G and so on and so forth. This was probably one of the last years where we didn't have those luxuries, where if we wanted to go out somewhere, we had to tell people when we were coming back. If we were in a jam, we'd hope we would be somewhere where there was a landline phone and so on and so forth. And the wife certainly makes a, a compelling story using that those probably lack of luxuries, but it also tells another deeper story. In other words, the movie starts with Joan's husband, Joe. I'm, I'm probably just going to say, I'm just going to call him Professor because jo- Joan sounds way too close to Joe. I'm getting the two mixed up already. But the Professor has been awarded a Nobel Prize for literature. And while, of course, he's celebratory, it also, as they're traveling from their home in Connecticut to Stockholm, Sweden, it also opens up a big can of worms when Joan Castleman begins to Glenn Close's character begins to question her life choices. And there are certainly aspects of this film and the characters that occupy it that make it understandable why a can of worms would proverbially open up. For instance, there is another writer who is following the Castlemans to Sweden who is a little bit too desperate to write a biography about Professor Castleman. And that writer, that desperate writer, is Nathaniel Bone, who's played in this movie by Christian Slater, who we haven't seen on the big screen for a while. He was in a show called Mr. Robot, but that recently got canceled. But Christian Slater still received really good reviews for his role on that show. There's also the Castleman's struggling writer of a son whose name is David, and he's played in this film by Max Irons. And he is very believable as Jonathan Price and Glenn Close's son, particularly the better relationship he has with his mother than with his father. Uh, In a lot of parent-child relationships, especially as the child reaches adulthood, there's usually one parent who's a little bit more accessible than the other and while you may not fight with one parent there's there's certainly a lot of expectations to which to live up particularly if the parent has already created a name for themselves there's certainly that that dynamic of a child wanting to be better than their parents and some and certainly there are children particularly of the rich and famous who struggle a lot more with that than do children of families with more modest means. But this movie plays a lot of emotions. Many of them are not particularly pleasant, but Glenn Close is amazing in this film. I am not sure if she is eligible for an Oscar nomination based on the fact that this film came out in 2017. I don't know what the rules are about the Academy Awards that dictate who can be nominated over who can't. I know some of the basic awards, but I don't know if they qualify for a film that was released 
you know, wa- was given a wide enough release in 2018, but actually debuted at a film festival in 2017. I just don't know. But I can tell you that Glenn Close acts amazingly in this film. Jonathan Price also acts really well, and the two of them together, whether their relationship is really good or really bad, they are both believable as a married couple. I don't know exactly how long these two have known each other. I know both of them have been acting since the 70s, and both of them have taken on lead roles. I don't think they've ever been in a movie together yet, and they certainly haven't taken on a, a, a role where both of them are headlining a movie. But I enjoyed this film immensely. I, I thought that the on-location shoot in Stockholm, Sweden was amazing. It certainly made the, the city look... Uh, like a place that you would visit. Of course, probably the fact that the Nobel Prize takes place or is given in Stockholm is probably already a a, a tourist-driving desire in and of itself. But this movie has some great on-location shots, both on the ground and also by helicopter. Maybe the... The helicopter shots were a bit bombastic, but it certainly didn't make the the city look any less beautiful. But really, the selling points of this movie are the performances, particularly Glenn Close and Jonathan Price. I was impressed by them both. I would probably go as far as to say that this is perhaps Glenn Close's best performance that she's ever had. She's had a lot to live up to, particularly in movies she did in the 80s, like The Big Chill, or perhaps most especially Fatal Attraction, but I actually think this performance tops them all, and I would love to see her get Academy recognition if she's eligible, but also Jonathan Price would be a shoe-in for Best Supporting Actor as well. But I absolutely love this movie. I can't say enough about it. And the direction by Bjorn Rung, who, of course, as you can tell from his name as a Swedish director, is certainly second to none as well. I don't think an American would have done a good job in such a movie. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I liked kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But I think it's time to head back in. Okay... Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. (laughs) I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Now that I've reviewed all the movies I'm going to review for you th- this show, it's now time to go into my next segment, which is what's, t- what's Coming Up Next. I almost screwed up the segment name there. The segment is What's Coming Up Next, which is a spoken word preview of movies that are coming out in a theater near you, unless otherwise specified, this coming weekend. And by that I mean the weekend of September 7th, through September 9th. And the biggest movie that's coming out this weekend is one that is actually a spin-off of The Conjuring, just like the movie the Annabelle movies were. And this one is called The Nun. And The Nun has already been making a lot of headlines, particularly because the preview for The Nun, which was released to YouTube, was so scary that YouTube actually took it off their site. That says a lot there, but I think YouTube is actually uh, probably cracking down on on movies that would be uh, scary to younger viewers. But I didn't see that preview. I don't see any previews, but I would be interested to see how The Nun is based on that reaction. But then again... It could be that the preview is better than the movie. That happens quite a bit. But The Nun, 
is about as follows. It is about a nun, but it's also about a priest with a haunted past and a novice on the threshold of her final vows, i.e. the nun in question, are sent by the Vatican to investigate the death of a young nun, okay, maybe that's the nun in question, in Romania and confront a malevolent force in the form of a demonic nun. So, uh, again, The Nun is a spinoff of The Conjuring. It stars Damien Bichir, Taisa Farmiga, Jonas Biaquit, and Bonnie Ahrens. In other words, actors I don't really know at the moment, but maybe this movie will be good. I don't know, but I will check it out, and I will review it for you come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is Peppermint, and this movie stars Jennifer Garner. Peppermint is a revenge story centering on a young mother, Jennifer Garner, who finds herself with nothing to lose and is now going to take from her enemies the very life they stole from her. Now, Jennifer Garner has made her living over the last 10, uh, 12 years playing either a romantic love interest or somebody's mother. She hasn't played an action she hasn't played in an action movie, at least not as a damsel in distress, since the 2005 movie Electra, which was a spinoff of Daredevil, which are both critically panned movies. Or at least, they've got decent reviews, at least Daredevil did when they came out, but the public now wants nothing to do with those films, and even Ben Affleck has denounced daredevil but either way jennifer garner used to be considered an action hero when she was doing the movies daredevil and electra and before that when she was on the tv show alias but in this case jennifer garner is an action hero again will she be successful or will this be another electra in other words a failed attempt at making a sweet nurturing woman an action hero in vain Who knows, but I will see this movie and I'll let you know if it succeeds or it fails, in my opinion, when I come back to do this show next week. Another movie coming out this coming weekend is God Bless the Broken Road, which is the name of a song by Rascal Flatts, but I think in this case, this is a religious film. So, this is about a woman who while grieving the loss of her husband, is struggling financially, but meets a race car driver and I guess develops a new relationship. So this movie stars people who aren't especially well-known. I don't know who Lindsay Pulsifer is, but she plays the lead in this movie. I do know who Jordan Sparks is. She co-stars in this film, probably as Lindsay Pulsifer's best friend. And also LaDainian Tomlinson, the... um, (laughs) the San, the former San Diego Charger is in this film as well. I guess he's starting an acting career for himself. We'll see how this movie is. Given that it's a religious film, I'm not going to write it off immediately, but uh, religious films have kind of burned me in the past. But I will see this film that's coming out in a theater near me, and I will let you know what I think come next week's show. And the other movie that's coming out is The Apparition, which is a movie that's That is about a journalist who is sent by the Vatican to investigate a young girl claiming to be visited by the Virgin Mary. That certainly sounds interesting, although it's a film that looks to be made in Italy. It's certainly directed by an Italian director. Um, Oh, actually, he's a French director. His name is Xavier Giannoli, although his last name sounds Italian. I don't know if that film's coming out in a theater near me, but if I see it, I'll let you know what I think next week. But that just about wraps things up for Words on Film for this show. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely my own. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. And Words on Film is, as usual, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. Until next week, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.